you have your Bible, please turn with me to Malachi chapter 1 and verse 6. Malachi chapter 1 and verse 6. It says this, A son honoreth his father, and a servant his master. If then I be a father, where is mine honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear? Saith the Lord of hosts unto you, O priests that despise my name. And ye say, Wherein have we despised thy name? I want to title this message tonight, Where is my honor? Let's pray. Dear God, I thank you for your spirit. I thank you for your word, for your presence. God, I ask that you would just take control of us the rest of this evening. Lord, minister in us and through us. God, I pray that you'd open our hearts and minds to receive your word with gladness, understanding that you love us and you have only the best in mind for us. I pray, God, that your goodness and your care for us is conveyed in every word tonight, every action that we take. Help us, Lord. Anoint us. Cover us. Transform us tonight. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Malachi, uh, very short book right at the end of the Old Testament. Uh, from what I understand, uh, Malachi ministered about 400 years before the time of Jesus. Uh, the name Malachi actually means my messenger. Some scholars say that perhaps uh, the man that we call Malachi was not named Malachi at all. Perhaps it was just a person. Uh, who was not mentioned by name, his family's not mentioned. Uh, he was quite literally uh, the Lord's messenger. Whether his name was Malachi or not, we don't know. But about 400 years before the time of Jesus, the setting is uh, a remnant of the Jews had returned from captivity in about 538 B.C. Uh, and then under the prophetic ministries of Haggai and Zechariah, they had rebuilt the temple. This happened in 520 to 516 B.C. And then about 60, 60 years later, in 458 B.C., Ezra came to help reestablish the nation. And then 14 years after that, in 444 B.C., Nehemiah came and rebuilt the wall. I tell you this because I personally I struggle with my, my timeline of you know, Old Testament events. Uh, if you've ever heard of the like, a chronological version of the Bible, uh, sometimes that can be helpful. But the Bible as we know it, of course, is not in chronological order, uh, but I digress. Um, basically, all this that had happened in Malachi's time, all these things that were going on, uh, they've been home from Babylon for about 100 years. Uh, this is significant. They're, they're no longer uh, in, a, in, a, in a terrible place. Yes, they were still under a governor. They perhaps were under Persian rule at this time, uh, but they were cured from idolatry thanks to the exile. And all these things that happened, when you look at the, the hundred years preceding this, there had been a lot of amazing things that happened. And it's easy to understand how that uh, the Jews at this time were probably, uh, probably somewhat excited, or, or at least as these things happened and as things were prophesied, uh, the excitement may have grown. Uh, but what happened over the course of that hundred years, despite all the good things that happened, uh, there were a lot of things that were prophesied that hadn't happened yet, and the people, uh, mainly the priests, had become uh, negligent of the house of God. Uh, the temple, of course, had been rebuilt. Sacrifices and feasts had resumed. Uh, there was these dramatic promises that prophets had given to them, uh, Haggai and Zechariah. Uh, they were not fulfilled yet, and people were discouraged. They were disappointed. They, they said, you know, this was supposed to happen and it hasn't happened yet. And now I don't know if it's going to happen at all. Uh, and it kind of went on this, this downward spiral and it led them to having a kind of a low regard uh, for the Lord. And you could say that they were in a state of uh, spiritual apathy almost. Uh, they were disillusioned about their future and they were skeptical of God's promises. They said, you know, here we are, but all this stuff was going to happen, but it hasn't happened yet. 
And we have, you know, some good things happen, but maybe God's forgotten about us now. Maybe, maybe we didn't get it right. Maybe we didn't hear right. Maybe those things that were said, maybe all this was, was for nothing. If this is the end, then they were, they were unsatisfied. And rather than turn that into something positive, it became a negative for them. Because it wasn't real long in this mindset that the priests, uh, they got careless in their, in their ministry. They, they, they weren't putting uh, good effort into it. And the people followed their bad example. This generation of the, the Jews was not guilty of gross idolatry in the sense that they were making other gods and setting up other things and completely forsaking uh, the Lord. They weren't guilty of that. But they had embraced something of a a dead orthodoxy. They they were going through the motions. They were doing what they were supposed to do, uh, but their heart wasn't in it. And what they were trying to do was get by with minimum effort and minimum sacrifice and try and meet minimum requirements. And when we're left to define that, when our humanity is left to define that, it never ends well. I'm going to read a few more verses from Malachi chapter 1. Malachi 1 and 1 says, The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. The Lord refers to his name in this chapter at least six different times. What does his name mean? Why would he do that? It's because his name is special, it's because he wants his name to be glorified. He he wants to remind them of who he is. And he's saying to the people, don't forget, I am the Lord. His character, his reputation is wrapped up in his name. The people that wore his name, he was trying to remind them, look, this is not only who I am, but it's who you are because you wear my name. And I want you to represent my name well. I want you to understand the privilege. He wants his name to be magnified in all the earth, but the priests, The Bible says they despised his name. Verse 2, I have loved you, saith the Lord. Yet ye say, wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother? Saith the Lord, yet I loved Jacob, and I hated Esau, and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. One commentator translates the first part of verse 2 as God saying, I have loved you. I do love you, and I will love you. He's reassuring his people. He's like, look, we we have something's not quite right here, but I want to reassure you right as we get started that I love you. I'm going to love you tomorrow. I loved you yesterday. Maybe things aren't perfect. Maybe you're not satisfied. Maybe I'm not satisfied, but I'm in covenant with you, and I love you, and I care about you. And from the outset, God wants to make it very clear to his people that I love you still. And I, you're still in the, in the palm of my hand. You're still the one that I have chosen. Pastor talked about Jacob and Esau. Uh, and this, this passage is, is, is spoken in a couple different places in the Bible when it says, Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated it. What it, I guess you could say that Jacob was chosen and Esau was not chosen. Not hated in the sense that, oh, I hate you and I want bad things to happen to you. But Jacob was chosen and Esau was not chosen. Uh, that, that's what he's, he's saying here. And the people's reply to what God says here is one that it's not always something that's spoken, but it's something that we often, we have in our hearts. I've had it in my heart. Maybe, maybe you have too. When you hear their reply, they say, to paraphrase, they say, God, if you really love me, why are things the way they are? It speaks to this doubt and this discouragement and even sin that they had in their hearts. When you read this story and understand the background of what's happening here, it it wasn't just little things that had gone wrong. It was forsaking a covenant. It was a covenant between husband and wife being broken. It was intermarrying with people that uh, were pagans or unbelievers. They, they They were falling far from covenant relationship uh, in a very very fast hurry. And the Lord says, verse 6, a son honors his father, 
and a servant his master. If then I be a father, where is mine honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear? Saith the Lord of hosts unto you, O priests that despise my name. And ye say, wherein have we despised thy name? God starts and says, look, I love you. But if I'm really your father, if you're going to claim me as father, then where's my honor? Where's, where's, the, where's the relationship? You see, through Malachi, God was asking the priests of Israel why they showed so little respect and honor to him in their sacrifices. That's how they showed honor. That's how they, that's how they worshiped, was through sacrifice. That, that's how it was in the Old Testament. They called him father, they called him master, but they didn't show reverence in their sacrifice. They gave inferior offerings. They gave things that they knew were prohibited. They knew were prohibited. They're, I don't believe there's a way they could have known that what they were doing wasn't right. I, I, I don't think that was the case because Leviticus 22 and Deuteronomy 15 talk about here's what you offer. And that was it. There was, there was no, if you're having a bad day, bring this. There was no, if you don't feel like it, then you can bring this. It was this. It was pass-fail. It was either you do or you don't. That, that's how it was. And I believe the priests knew what they were doing. You see, the priests, they got to a point where they weren't grateful for their ministry anymore. The priests were complaining about what the people gave. Maybe they said, well, God, if you would give us better people that would bring a more acceptable offering, maybe we could offer something that's acceptable to you, but we're just going to give you what they gave us. They complained about what a hassle it was to be a priest. <laughs> Tough job. God, I, you know, what, what used to be an honor for them, what used to be such a, a high calling and something so special, all of a sudden now is, oh, I really don't want to do this. I really don't want to go to church, as it were. I really don't want to be the one. I really don't want to be responsible for this. I'd rather do something else. I'd rather go here, rather go there, whatever it might have been. But offering diseased and blemished animals was an insult to God. It was an insult to God. It was a dishonorable sacrifice. And it's really ironic because they're trying to pacify God and win his favor with polluted sacrifice. And it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. He either accepts it or he doesn't. There's no halfway. There's no, there's no saying, well, well, God, it was close. Don't I get points for, for, for being close? I mean, it's almost right. You see what I'm working with here? You see what I had to deal with here? It's either accepted or it's not. Jacob have I loved. Esau have I hated. Jacob is chosen. Esau is not chosen. Verse 10 says, Who is there even among you that would shut the doors for naught? Neither do you kindle fire on mine altar for naught. I have no pleasure in you, saith the Lord of hosts. Neither will I accept an offering at your hand. That's about as strong as it can get. And the Lord started by saying, I love you. I want you to understand I love you. I'm going to love you tomorrow. I have always loved you. And he's progressed to this point where he says, look, I love you, but I have no pleasure in what you're doing. I, ha I have no pleasure in you. And I will not accept an offering at your hand. One commentator puts it this way. God thought it was better to shut the doors rather than continue worthless worship. Pastor, you alluded to this. I, I believe it was on Sunday not everything is offered, or not everything that is offered to God as worship is accepted by God as worship. Not everyone who goes to church is a Christian. You know, it's, it's the age-old thing. Just because you sit in church doesn't make you a Christian. Doesn't make me a Christian. 
A lot of churches put a whole lot of time and effort into growth, evangelism, planting churches, doing all these things. You can find mega churches. You can find them in Wisconsin. You don't have to even go that far to, to, to find them. They're, they're wildly successful, it seems. And a lot of these churches neglect prayer. And they neglect true worship. And they're not concerned about what's acceptable ministry unto the Lord. They say, well, let's do this. Let's, let's have this. Let, let's, let's, let's make it uh, seeker-friendly. Let, let's create an experience for, for people to come to it that, that they love and that they enjoy and that they're comfortable. And that stuff in and of itself isn't wrong. That, that's what makes this so difficult. That, that's what makes this, this message that, that, that God has given them is, is so difficult because it's a fine line. Well, relating it to our churches today, it's a fine line. Is it, is it wrong to, uh, to have a coffee shop in your church? No, not necessarily. Is it wrong if we spend more time in the coffee shop than we do in prayer? Probably. You see, it, it's, a, it's a really fine line. Is it wrong to, to make, make church a comfortable place? Is it wrong to have padded pews? Is it wrong to welcome guests and, and, and roll out the red carpet for guests? No, it's not wrong. That, that can be a very good thing. Is it wrong to have groups and ministries and titles and all these other things? No, it's not wrong. What's wrong is when we flow out of those things. What's wrong is when we find our value in those things. What's wrong is when, when we find our strength in those things. It's wrong when we put our value in our own ability. We say, you know what, I know, I got it all figured out. I know what people want. I know what they like. I know what they need. I know what they're looking for. Come on, let's just do this. And you might, you might know it. I don't want God to come to me and say, hey, Tim, everything you're doing in ministry, why don't you just stop? I don't want him to come to me and say, it would probably just be better for you not to do that if you're not going to do the most important part. If you're not going to honor me and what you're doing, then it's better not to do it at all. What would you say? What, what would you do tonight if the Lord spoke to you and said, I have no pleasure in you. I won't accept an offering at your hand. That would be a hard thing. That would be a really hard thing. You see, the priests were offering insincere worship. It was selfish. And that kind of worship was not only unsatisfying to God, but it was also unsatisfying to the worshipers. It was as hollow for the people as it was for God. That, that hurts. That hurts because we're the church. We're, we're not just people that warm pews. If my, if my ministry, if what I present uh, to the world, if, if, if it's cold and dead to people who need salvation, shame on me. True worship is never con contemptible. It's never a weariness. But what they were offering wasn't true worship. Verse 14 says, But cursed be the deceiver, which hath in his flock a male, and voweth and sacrificeth unto the Lord a corrupt thing. For I am a great king, saith the Lord of hosts, 
and my name is dreadful among the heathen. Catch what he's saying here? Cursed be the deceiver if you have it and you don't give it. If I have better and I choose to give less. In the Old Testament, it was a curse on that person. Not only a curse, but then I had the label of deceiver. Who am I deceiving? I'm not deceiving God. He knows. He sees all, but I'm deceiving myself. I'm deceiving other people that need to know truth, that need something real. It's a lot like Ananias and Sapphira. They pretended to surrender everything to God, but really they did not. I was praying and I asked God what he wanted me to say tonight. I different, different messages, different times. It, it goes different ways. God speaks to different people in different ways. But uh, I really, as soon as I asked, I feel like God answered by asking a question. And that question is, where is my honor? That's what he asked me. I said, what do, what do you want me to tell the church? And he said, where is my honor? First Peter 2.9. You can quote it by heart. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Why do you quote this verse? We get so excited about this verse. I'm here to tell you or to remind you tonight that anyone who has been filled with the Holy Ghost, baptized in Jesus' name, striving to live a holy life, guess what? You're the New Testament priesthood. You're a member of the New Testament priesthood. Every single person under the sound of my voice right now, it's not pastors, the priest, and we are the people. It's not pastor and excel, they're the priest, and God's going to come down on them if they're not offering. No. We don't give our offering to pastor to give to God for us. No. No. You and me, we're a chosen generation. You and me are a royal priesthood. We are the New Testament priesthood. Not just department heads. It's anyone who obeys the gospel that enters into a royal priest, this royal priesthood. So I have to ask the question. That God only asked me one question, and now I'm going to ask a whole bunch of questions. Uh, rhetorical, if you will. Are we, as members of the royal priesthood, are we despising his name? Do we show God disrespect by questioning his love for us? Do we despise his name by doing his work in a careless manner? Malachi shows us that the people in his day, they got bored with their blessings. They got bored with all the good things going on, and they took for granted the privilege of ministry. I have to ask myself, am I doing the same thing? The Bible commentator Matthew Henry said this, if we worship God ignorantly and without understanding, we bring the blind for sacrifice. If we do it carelessly, if we are cold, dull, and dead in it, we bring the sick. If we rest in the bodily exercise and do not make heart work of it, we bring the lame. And if we suffer vain thoughts and distractions to lodge within us, we bring the torn as our sacrifice. We like to quote Matthew 18.20 all the time. We say, well, we're gathered in Jesus' name, so God's bound by his word to be here. 
That's true. I believe God honors his word. I believe he is indeed in our midst. The question remains, are we offering acceptable sacrifices? Is he pleased with what we're doing and how we're doing it? If God was sitting right next to you, would he be pleased with your praise, with your worship, with your prayer? With He's not sitting next to you. He's literally in your heart. He's in your soul. He's inside of you. I worry sometimes because... Yes, we're gathered in Jesus' name. Yes, he's here. But maybe I'm wrong, but I, I don't necessarily see anything in the Word that says that God's obligated to do things for us just because we're gathered in his name. I don't see anything that tells me, regardless of your sacrifice, God will do this. God will do that. I believe many times... God moves and ministers to individuals who did bring a right sacrifice. There can be one person here tonight who came with the right heart and the right intention and the right offering, and God, I believe, will minister to that person. Maybe there's two or three or five. And how many times have I been in church and I've seen it happen, and it's like, wow, so-and-so is really getting blessed tonight. Wow, so-and-so, they're really getting serious in their prayer tonight. And I go home and I say, whoa, I guess we had good church. I guess, I guess that, was a, that was a really good time, and, and I was part of it. I've adopted a prayer that I used to hear a preacher pray all the time. And it's really simple, and it says, Lord, please don't just bless what we're doing, but show us what you're blessing. We have to ask ourselves, am I giving my best or am I just saying, okay, God, here's all you're going to get from me. Take it or leave it. If you want it, great. If not, that's all I have for you. Do you think God honors that? Or perhaps we say to God, well, I'm too busy. God, you know my life. I'm too busy to commit to helping with a ministry at the church. God, you, you should just be glad I showed up. Okay. God, you should be honored that I'm here. And God says, no, where is my honor? Or what about this? God, I'll give you my best. Once a pastor asked me to lead this fill-in-the-blank ministry. God, I've got a, great, a lot of great ideas, and I'd love to do that, and I'll put my whole heart into it someday, but not until it's mine, not until it's in my hands. Until then, I'm just kind of along for the ride. Begs the question, do we despise ministering before the Lord? Is it weariness to show up to church? Clean the church, unlock the doors, take hands as people come in, come early for music or sound or media. Do we despise Sunday school, children's church, youth group? Do we teach those things with, or do we treat those things with contempt? Is it just a chore? Is it too much to pray for 20 minutes before each service? Do we get irritated if pastor preaches longer than 30 minutes? Are we annoyed with altar calls that last longer than five minutes? Do we have other things to do? we have somewhere else to be? I'm talking to myself because I struggle with these things. My flesh, my flesh would rather not. My, my, my flesh is, is weak. Maybe we're just really excited about our own ideas. Maybe we've got all the plans and we know just how we're going to accomplish the tithe of the city vision. 
Maybe we just said, well, we'll, we'll do it this way. God, we're going to do this. Bless this, God. Here's what we're going to do. You bless it, okay? And we've drifted from the way that he wants us to do it. I'm asking questions. I'm not saying this is exactly where we're at. Maybe you're tired of hearing about the vision. Maybe you don't think it's happening quickly enough. Maybe you think, well, if pastor would just do this. We have to ask ourselves, we've got to take inventory regularly. Are we trying to take things that began in the spirit and finish them in our human abilities? That's not going to work. It's going to lead to frustration. I'll say this. Not one of the priests in the Old Testament was a perfect person. Not one of them. And neither are we. God does not expect perfection from us. He knows we can never be perfect. He is the only perfect one. That's why, just like in the Old Testament, he gives us clear and specific instruction on how to approach him, how to minister before him, how to honor him. He says, your humanity is never going to figure it out. Your best effort, your best offering that you could think to give me, I, I don't want any part of it. And I know you're not perfect, so here's how I'm going to help you. I'm going to show you how to do it. I'm going to tell you, if you exactly do this, I will be pleased. When you look at the, the Old Testament, the tabernacle plan, everything from the materials to the measurements to the design, everything was laid out perfectly. Perfect detail. Down, down to the, the last stitch. It was perfect. It wasn't humans that came up with that. God said, just do it this way. Just do it this way. I know you're not perfect. I, I, I know you're going to have bad days, but just do it this way. And though we are imperfect, our offering will be accepted if we do it His way. Praise God. I was thinking about it. And I, it came to my mind that throughout Bible and secular history, church history, every single New Testament awakening has had the same foundation. It's built on the exact same God-given methods. It might not always look like it. It might seem like, whoa, people were just more open to it. Oh, there was a tragedy in the world at the time that caused people's hearts Maybe. Maybe God used events to turn, turn people's hearts and open people's hearts, perhaps. But every single time, there's a foundation of repentance, of prayer, of fasting, of sacrifice, of worship. Who's doing it? Whose job is it to do that? world's not going to do it. <laughs> Our job. My job. That's, the, that's, what, that's what the church is for. I'm thankful. I, I know we, sometimes we all get different things out of uh, what, the, what guest ministers preach and what they share. But I'm thankful for the things that Brother Hanscom said and the things that he shared. Um, a man of just amazing faith. And I was so struck by, um, he didn't come up here and try and wow us with, look how much I know about Scripture. Look, I, I found the secret verse that no one knows about that unlocks everything good. It wasn't like that at all. It was simple. It was the Word, it was faith, and it was prayer. And if it didn't work, We'll start over with some word and some faith and some prayer. And if that doesn't work, we're going to pray and we're going to have faith and then we're going to look at the word. It, it, was, it was the same the same foundation. Same thing. Beautiful. Powerful. Simple. When the foundation is right, 
supernatural results follow, and he can tell you about that. He told us some of that. Miracles, church growth, favor with God and man. All those things follow. These signs shall follow, not be manufactured by, not go out in front of, not once, you, once we see you start to do it, then we'll pray and fast for more. These signs shall follow them that believe. If we believe, if we really believe, we'll say, you know what, God, the method that worked 2,000 years ago, that model can still work today. Do our, we, we always say methods changed and the message doesn't. Great, wonderful. Let, let, let's do whatever we can to, to reach people in the age and the day that we live in. But what is our most powerful tool? What, what is it? What is it that sets us apart? What is it that makes you different? Because a lot of churches have coffee shops. A lot of churches have youth groups. I, I was at a church a couple weeks ago. I thought, there, there's just, you know, there's no way that, that this church is doing something for the young people. And I'm walking through it, and I come to a door. Youth group room. I was like, hey, look at that. We're not the only church with a youth group. We're not the only church with men's and ladies and children's church and Sunday school and all these things are good. I'm not saying anything against them. But if you think that alone is going to set us apart, it won't. Well, we pray. Well, other churches pray too. There are well-intentioned people that pray every single day. Read the Bible every single day. What makes us different? It's the Holy Ghost. It's, it's the anointing of God. And that kind of fire doesn't just fall on any old sacrifice. It, it is not, God, we, we, we belong to this denomination. We have it on our sign or we, whatever. It's printed in our bulletin that we're affiliated with such and such. Therefore, God, show them all. Show them why we're better. When you look at the tabernacle plan, uh, the, the fire that initiated the entire thing wasn't something that man did. It had to come from God. They didn't go any farther until that fire from God came. They didn't say, well, let's just move on and try and do the incense. Nope. Well, let's just go on and let's just try and push our way into the Holy of Holies. Let's just get there. Let's just double our efforts. Let's just try harder. Nope. I'm closing if you would stand with me. I'm just going to open the altar if you want to pray in your pew. If you want to pray up here, by all means, you're welcome. But tonight I believe God is asking us individually and as a church, where is my honor? Doesn't mean he's mad at us. Doesn't mean he doesn't love us. Doesn't mean that all the other prophecies that have been given over the last couple weeks, couple months, couple years, doesn't nullify any of that at all. He's just asking, where is my honor? And I believe that the only proper response that we can have is to make God's methods the main thing again. Make God's methods the main thing in our personal lives, in our church services. It says, God, every single other church in this town does all of these things. The only thing that's going to make it different is if your fire falls. The only thing that's going to make it different is if the Holy Ghost works in me and through me. The only thing that's going to be different is you, God. The only thing different is your anointing. And I've got to have it. I want it. 
And you're not obligated to give it to me just because I say I want it. God, I don't want to be oblivious to what you're doing. I don't want to come to church and watch other people get blessed and and think that I had anything to do with it if I'm not giving a sacrifice that's acceptable. If I'm not giving anything at all, if I'm not involved at all, God, help me to look at Your Word and see what You would say to me tonight. God, I don't want You to minister in church despite my involvement, but I want to be a sanctified vessel that honors You. I want You to be able to work through me. Don't leave me out of what You're doing. Dear God, put it in our hearts again. Put your word in our hearts again. Not just to read and rejoice over, but something to pray. Something to become our cry from our hearts. It says, God, let the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. What I do at church, how I lead my ministry, how I serve in my ministry, whatever it is, whether it's cleaning the bathroom, I don't know, whatever I find myself in my power to do, God, I want to do it with everything I have. I want to do it the best that I can. God, I'm determined not to try and offer you something that I wouldn't give to my neighbor, that I wouldn't feed to my family. God, I want you to have the best of me. If I'm too busy, if something else is in the way, then God, please remove it. Help me to get my priorities right. God, I'm asking you for your mercy tonight. I know you love us. I know you care about us. Help us to present our lives, our bodies our ministries, our attitudes as a living sacrifice. God, make us holy. Make us acceptable in Your sight. God, help us to remember what our reasonable service is to honor You with what we do. God, I don't believe You're here saying, oh, You have to do more. You have to double Your efforts. No. God, I believe You're asking us to minister from a right place, from a right motive from a right attitude, from a right spirit, from a place of maturity in the Holy Ghost that says, I know I'm not perfect. Yes, I'm going to make mistakes. My ministry will never be perfect. But Lord God Almighty, if you will just anoint me, if you will help me, if you will anoint my brothers and sisters, let your name be glorified. Let your name be elevated in this city, not to make us look good, but that they would know that there's a God that cares and honors right sacrifice. Dear God, tonight as one church body, we demolish every single argument and pretense that attempts to rival the true knowledge of God in our lives. God, we take captive every single thought to make it obedient to you God, I'm not going to complain. I'm not going to doubt. I'm going to take whatever I have. It might not seem like very much. It might not seem like enough. But God, I'm going to pray over it. And I'm going to fast over it. And I'm going to quote the word. And I'm going to offer it to you. And I'm going to trust you with the results. I'm going to have faith that you're going to do right here what you've done all over the world. And oh God, I pray. I pray that you don't let us become more like the world. Don't let us become more like denominal churches that have a form of godliness but lack the power. God, transform our hearts. Transform my mind so I can see clearly what you call good and acceptable and perfect. God, teach us, remind us tonight how to walk in your spirit. Teach us how to walk in your word. 
Teach us how to be exercised by your supernatural giftings for your glory alone. God, I give you my honor tonight. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, God, for failing you. I'm sorry for not doing it the right way, but God, tonight, I change tonight, God. I make a change tonight. No matter how busy I am, no matter how tired I am, no matter how frustrated I am, God, I minister before you. God, I don't minister to pastor. I minister to you. And you are a great king. God, help me to support my brothers and sisters. Help me to encourage them. Lord, as your anointing pours out on pastor, let us be under his authority and his leadership. Let your anointing touch every single one of us. God, that your name will be praised and that you will be glorified and your will can be done in us and through us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.